guazen saiatzera bintzat ikustera, zein den lau amarkada hauetan, Islandiak egin duen bidea, eta zer dugun handik ikasteko, egindakoaz eta une honetan gogoetan duten bestelako orientabidez. Gurekin dugu Trigi Halgrisson. I think I have pronounced it correctly. Bera da, hain justu ere, Islandiako genero berdintasuneko zentrotik honen berri emango diguna. Badu esperientzia aski luzea, gai hauetan espakarrik jardun bide praktikoan, baita ere jardun bide akademikoan. Bere iziki enpresetan egin beharreko aldaketez diardu bere ikerketak eta jardun du bere lanean. Ekarri digun begiratua injustu ere hori xeda. Zer gertatu den, nola joan den garatzen lau amarkada hauetan Islandiako genero berdintasuneko eta bere iziki konziliazioko politiken esparru hau eta aurrera begira zer. Hori xe, berak ekarriko digun gogoetan. Beraz, Trigi Halgrisson? It's yours. Thank you. Islandiara begira. Yes, thank you. Iceland, and that's your best in the stage. Sorry, I was... Preoccupied with the translation. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, inviting me here. Thank you, uh, the provincial council government and uh, the organizers of this conference. I would like to thank uh, the clown uh, Virginia Imas for giving me the opportunity to say whatever I want, as I uh, understood from her presentation yesterday. Uh, I will be giving a historical uh, context. I will not. Uh, giving, I will not be discussing the history for four decades in a half an hour, but uh, I will be giving a, a short historical context. I will discuss the labor market, uh, the general outline of the uh, Icelandic labor market and how it refers to uh, the situation of women, positives and negatives. I will uh, tell you a little bit about the parental leave in Iceland and how it has been used as a policy tool to uh, advance the situation of women in the labor market, uh, as well as uh, directing to men uh, their responsibilities within the family and the labor market. Uh, then I will continue to uh, give some uh, ideas about what we can do at the organizational level, as it refers to uh, provisions of the Gender Equality Act in Iceland. And uh, then, finally, I will ask some questions about if we should possibly reframe the issue of work-life balance a little bit. Um, I come from the Center for Gender Equality, and uh, the Center for Gender Equality has a very specific position within, within government in Iceland. We are uh, lucky in the way that uh, we have a Gender Equality Act, there has been an act since uh, 90, uh, 90, uh, sorry, uh, 76, and uh, it has taken, taken some changes through the decades. And our current act is from 2008, and that act gives the Center for Gender Equality a very uh, specific role with regards to possible interventions and uh, for lack of a better comparison, we often refer to ourselves as a type of gender equality police in Iceland. Um, our roles include uh, following through on gender mainstreaming within government, within public uh, organizations and, and municipalities. We. Uh, have a specific uh, agenda to improve the position of uh, women in society. The Act acknowledges that the position of women is uh, worse in, in many areas than men. We also have the responsibility of including men and promoting the involvement of men in gender equality issues. And I'll come back to that in the end of my little uh, presentation. We collect research and statistics, we promote research, and uh, we tackle discrimination in the labor market through specifically 
uh, gender equality plans, which I will discuss uh, a little further uh, in detail uh, later. This picture taken in 75 shows a, a group, a group, a crowd of women that marched downtown Reykjavik and uh, protested, very directly protested the situation of women within the labor market. We have a history of, of protests in, in Iceland. Um, non-violent, uh, possibly because we do not have an army, we do not have a, a armed police, so we can quite happily protest in front of, front of the parliament building, uh, throw bananas and, uh, and milk products. Uh, this is uh, uh, 75, when 90% uh, of women in the labor market uh, had a strike and paralyzed the labor market, uh, the economy, for one day. It is uh, uh, um, historical in many ways. It has uh, become a little bit of a myth. Uh, uh, on different times, uh, men would make fun of this day, uh, but uh, the, the general consensus was very positive. Even the very conservative media in Iceland took no issue with this fact. It was an act of justice promotion, uh, and uh, men basically were put in the position to take care not only of, uh, of uh, workplaces, but also of children. And uh, to give some uh, idea of uh, the impact this had, uh, for some time this would be called the Sausage Day, because uh, that day all men were presented with the fact that they had to cook dinner and all the sausages in uh, the stores uh, were sold out because they didn't know what to do. So they would, uh, they would cook sausages. Uh, it had a, a, a very general support, but it also had a very immediate effect, both uh, with regards to legislation, because the year after, in, in, in 76, the first Gender Equality Act was passed by Parliament. A few years later, in 1980, Iceland elected the first democratically elected president of a democracy, Vigdís Finnbogadóttir. In her opening speech as president, she acknowledged that this movement was responsible for putting her in power. So, uh, this is, uh, should not be taken lightly. Um, uh, subsequently, uh, in, in 83, we had a women's alliance uh, that uh, got into power in, 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 in Parliament and greatly improved the, the ratio of, of women in Parliament. This picture here is taken, taken on Monday last. On Monday, um, sorry about the quality, this was uh, screen uh, shots from uh, Facebook. I didn't have uh, time to get the rights for the, the pictures. Uh, on Monday, uh, women marched in order to protest the lack of progress with regards to equal pay. Uh, this is a result of a constant and very determined grassroots uh, feminist uh, movement in, in Iceland. These are friends of mine here uh, in the ladder, uh, have a, a scarf that they put around the neck of a, a statue of our former president or our, like a, a liberation hero. And um, uh, there are many very interesting developments with regards to this grassroots movements and connections even to Europe. And to name one is uh, the connection with the grassroots in, in, in Poland with regards to abortion laws in Poland, which uh, we can go into later. So gender equality in Iceland, we have a little bit of a problem. We are always presented as being the top of the uh, list. We are, in a sense, because uh, the World Economic Forum has uh, made a, uh, an index which we have topped for the last uh, eight years now, because on Wednesday a new list was published, 
and we still remain top of the leaderboard, uh, followed closely by our friends in Norway and uh, the other Scandinavian countries. The reasons for this is uh, mostly three parts. Uh, education, where women are a, a large majority, uh, actually a majority, not a large majority, of graduates of universities. Uh, equal access to health, good health of both uh, men and women. And uh, success for the last 30 years with regards to women participation in po politics. Uh, we have uh, uh, various statistics uh, demonstrating this. In 2009, for example, we had uh, an equal number of ministers, uh, men and women. We have 44% of parliamentarians, uh, MPs, are women and uh, a uh, sizable uh, percentage of municipality leaders are women. We have uh, recently had also the first openly gay prime minister, Johanna Sigurdottir, in 2013, no, sorry, in, in 2009-2013, but Iceland is not yet a gender equality paradise, and the weakest link is the labor market. The labor market I'm supposed to be presenting as the model here uh, is our weakest link. We have a highly segregated labor market with women, uh, a large majority of traditional care uh, workers, uh, kindergarten teachers, nurses, etc., and men, of course, a, a majority of, uh, of uh, traditional uh, male uh, sectors. This is a, a time series, if you will, of a, a labor participation, participation rates from 20 to uh, 2015. Uh, take note that uh, there is a jump here in, in the series from 60 to 80. And this is, a, a, I would like to say, a result of, of uh, these demonstrations, but also, of course, must be taken into consideration. This is also evidence of the modernization of Icelandic service society uh, and uh, a general modernization of, of the Icelandic labor market. But uh, in 2015, we have 80% of women uh, participating in the labor market. And we have now for decades been uh, the highest of the OECD uh, with regards to female labor participation. But if we look at the active labor market, we are faced with some of the very similar problem, problems uh, other, other countries have. 66% of women in the labor market have full-time uh, full jobs, as opposed to 87% of men. So uh, this heavily influences the uh, equal pay gap. Uh, this means that 34% uh, of women have part-time jobs, where only 13% of men have part-time jobs. And we have a very long work week. We have uh, one of the highest uh, work weeks in the OECD, where uh, the average work week of men is 44 hours. This is the average work week. And in some sectors, like uh, financial sectors and, uh, and uh, healthcare, we have an excess of 50 hours a week. So uh, th this is the problem. And this is uh, very, uh, very uh, important when we discuss the issue of work-life balance in Iceland, how to tackle this problem. Uh, why? Uh, uh, why is this a problem with regards to other issues uh, than uh, gender equality uh, pay gap? This also uh, affects the possibilities of establishing and maintaining a pension fund. So this translates into women's pensions. So we're not only seeing a, a, a gender pay gap uh, now, we're also seeing this later on affecting women. So it has a has uh, consequences uh, into women's futures. One of the issues that uh, Iceland is famous for with regards to gender equality is the parental leave, and in particular the PAT 
maternity leave, the leave of fathers. In 2000, uh, after a, a period of, let's say, a little less than five years, we passed a law in Iceland saying, okay, uh, we acknowledge that we need to get the parental leave in order, but let's do it like this. Uh, we have three months assigned to women, three months assigned to men, non-transferable. Three months, men and women can decide themselves how they share. And in practicality, in practice, women take this. They take the, the six months, and in, in practice, they also extend this six months to a period of uh, often uh, 12 months. So they're away from the labor market for a year after a childbirth, uh, and they're allowed to do this. Uh, and the aim of this act, and it, it, I often uh, state this, the aim of this act is, is uh, it has two aims. Uh, first is to uh, provide a, a buffer for uh, work-life balance, but the second aim is also the rights of the child, the rights of the child itself in infancy to have access to both parents and to have uh, care uh, during uh, the first year. Um, this, uh, after 2000 research showed that uh, this greatly increased the, uh, the uh, uh, not only the equal stance of, of men and women, but greatly increased the involvement of, of men in, in uh, upbringing. Something like 90% uh, of fathers used these three months. They did, however, use it in a, a, a cut-up period. They would take uh, a month, uh, then go back to work, take another month, and so on. So there are some problems that the, the legislation didn't anticipate. But in general, this also had a very important effect on the normalization of fathers pushing the strollers, taking care of infants, giving milk, taking babies to coffee houses, etc. So I was very happy when I came here down to uh, San Sebastian. The first thing I saw coming out of the hotel was a father pushing a stroller with no mother in sight, with a very small child. So maybe I thought, oh, okay, this is, um, we're not so special. <laughs> but, but this is a, a, a part of the, uh, the uh, issues we face. But however, did it have the desired effects? Uh, after the crisis in 2008, we had a, a financial crisis, uh, there were uh, cuts to the, the ceiling of payments. They were lowered three times in order to uh, cost cut. This resulted in fewer, fewer fathers taking parental leave or pay, taking just part of it, not taking the whole three months. It's hard to say that this causally affected fertility rates, but it is, uh, it is tempting to uh, make the connection that uh, childbirth has gone down from uh, a, a 2.2 uh, average children per mother to a 1.8. So we are seeing a number in fertility rates in Iceland now for the first time since the, uh, well, since uh, recorded uh, statistics that we have uh, an unsustainable uh, fertility rate, which is a, a huge problem as we have acknowledged here in our discussions yesterday with regards to uh, economic effects. I mean, how many children are we giving birth to now that will sustain an economy later? And this is a, a very uh, important issue. Going uh, to what we do, uh, discussing in particular what we do with regards to legislation uh, on work-life balance, the Gender Equality Act uh, says that every company that has 25 employees or more must have a gender equality plan. And our role at the Center for Gender Equality is to enforce this act, which we do very actively, 
in this act, there are four, no, sorry, in this uh, provisions on the gender equality uh, plan, there are four pillars. One has to do with equal pay, wage equality. One is to do with uh, professional development and uh, lifelong learning. One is on sexual harassment and, and sexual discrimination within the workplace, which we have had, uh, in, especially in recent years, very considerable developments and very interesting developments. And uh, finally, we have this provision on uh, work-life balance. I won't read the text, and uh, maybe you will have access to this, but it says that employers should take measures to uh, enable women and uh, men to reconcile their professional obligations. And uh, uh, it has been very practical in terms of the uh, latter part of this paragraph, where it says that it should facilitate the return of women after childbirth. So initially, when this uh, provision was, uh, was in, in effect, uh, women would call the Center for Gender Equality saying, OK, I was on uh, maternity leave, and now I come back. I don't have the same job, basically. This uh, created a very uh, vocal, uh, vocal uh, uh, let me say, uh, people were outraged by, uh, by the fact that uh, this could happen, and, uh, and we, we basically we don't get many complaints anymore. So employers, they know about these, uh, about these provisions, about this uh, obligation. So they do not try to to maneuver around this. Sorry. So, uh, what have we done to uh, increase awareness about work-life balance uh, provisions? We have had this uh, uh, awareness raising uh, initiative since uh, 2011. It's called Hid Gutnayabvaye, or Making the Golden Balance, on uh, um, uh, the objective of this uh, campaign is not only to uh, reach women, but especially to reach fathers and uh, tell them to be aware of their uh, obligations. It is uh, specifically directed at companies and municipalities. The municipalities have very uh, very uh, definite roles in providing uh, daycare facilities. And this is uh, in relation to the discussion about work-life balance not being a single issue of organizational design, care policies and daycare facilities are absolutely vital to the whole general idea that women and men can create a balance between work and, and family life. We have a heavily subsidized uh, daycare policy in Iceland where uh, a month uh, will cost uh, per child something like 200 to 300 euros. And this means that uh, this system acknowledges uh, it acknowledges the, the, not only the, the, the care policy, but also it's built around the whole idea of there being a dual earner model, that both men and women work, that there should not be a system in place that, uh, that, uh, that promotes a, a single earner uh, household. Uh, uh, part of the, the program on, on, on work-life balance, uh, this initiative, was to get fathers more involved in uh, the preschools as well as the compulsory schools. And this uh, uh, initiative, Fathers Have the Right to Know, was specifically aimed at the preschools contacting fathers first when there was an issue with a child in the daycare, uh, uh, in, in the kindergarten, you call the father first because we've uh, found statistics or reports 
that uh, in 1995, uh, uh, I believe it was, in 95% of instances, uh, the kindergarten would call the mother because they were the first line of reference. So just push fathers above and, and call them. And uh, this, I mean, it's, it's a small gesture, but it had very practical implications, saying that there's something uh, you need to address, you call the father, and this also sends the, the signal to his employer, he may be called upon. Yeah? And then, uh, in addition, uh, the compulsory schools uh, have had programs to encourage fathers' participation in, in seminars and meetings and so forth. Um, what do we do at the organizational level, the workplace level? Uh, bringing children to work day was an initiative was heavily criticized. What, do you, what, what type of signal does that send? Are we supposed to be juggling children in the workplace? Not necessarily. Uh, flexible working hours, also heavily criticized. Is that what we need? Do we need to be online with our remote desktop, always on the job? Not necessarily. So it boiled down to uh, ideas of we must address the working hours. It's a key issue. So we had pilot projects in Reykjavik, the capital city, on reducing the working hours or the work week, and uh, it produced very positive effects. And now, uh, government is uh, promoting a new initiative just uh, last month on uh, getting uh, organizations to partake in a new initiative on a shorter work, work week, addressing the issue of family as a quality of life, as uh, we have done in uh, uh, the work of the Center for Gender Equality, more and more we find opportunities in addressing gender equality as an issue of quality of life, not just the rights of women. Obviously they are the rights of women, but in order to increase the quality of life we address uh, Address, uh, sorry, uh, it has uh, uh, quality of life, sorry. I lost uh, my train of thought just. On the individual level and the promotion of active fatherhood, we have, as I uh, said earlier, the role of the Center for Gender Equality in promoting fathers, but also the role of government and local authorities. Uh, the reasons for doing this is uh, findings that uh, the women experience uh, higher levels of stress with regards to work and the, and the uh, work-life balance issues. But I was just discussing earlier, we have also very conflicting results in our studies. And uh, one of these results has been that fathers, they complain more about the problem of work-life balance uh, with regards to the effect it has on their involvement in the family, in um, taking care of children and uh, doing housework. This is a little bit strange when you think of it because women do more of the housework. So we complain more, which is uh, also a little stereotypical of men. Uh, we have the issue of uh, gender ideals being very very uh, present in Icelandic society, the good mother and the good provider, and we continue to tackle this. And homes are now a uh, uh, little bit the field of gender equality battle. And uh, we have research now that uh, uh, we have used to promote the idea, not only that fathers get more involved in the home, but also that women may possibly need to do less and uh, we were tackling the idea that does the home need to be spotless and shiny all the time or possibly not? Uh, which is, may sound like a trivial issue, but when it comes down to hours of the, uh, of the uh, day, maybe we should uh, uh, attribute some attention to this. Two initiatives I would like to discuss specifically. 
We have had work groups on the issue of man and equality that tackled the issue of work-life balance. It came uh, up with recommendations that were typical recommendations that we've heard uh, uh, throughout the need for organizations to acknowledge their duties, etc. But uh, two, uh, well, at least one very progressive recommendation uh, with regards to parental leave is introducing a mandatory leave for fathers. Uh, women have a mandatory two weeks leave. And this is due to recommendations from the World Health Organization saying that due to the physical effects of childbirth, uh, women cannot work two weeks after childbirth. So we came up with the idea, well, maybe we should have the same for men. And it goes to uh, the same objectives as the, as the Parental Leave Act, is that when you employ a man and a woman in your uh, organization, you will have to anticipate that they will take the same amount of time. In addition to this, the Center for Gender Equality has promoted and lobbied for very actively that we extend the time period of the parental leave and divide it equally, where men will get six months and women get six months and there will be non-transferable and there will be no period of uh, time they can distribute amongst themselves. It uh, speaks, to the, speaks to the objective of the act as a, as a work-life balance tool. Uh, there was a working group on work-life balance, which was connected to the project I, I, uh, I mentioned earlier, and they put it to government that there was a need or was a demand for a dialogue of the shorter work week, which I have discussed, but also acknowledgement of the complexity of the issues and the, um, and the let me say, uh, that it is useless to address work-life balance as a single issue. We must address work-life balance as one of many issues of gender equality. So when we uh, address equal pay, we also address work-life balance. When we address discrimination within the workplace, we also address work-life balance. And when we address uh, care policies, we are addressing work-life balance. And there is an, an acknowledgement of the complexity and the need for a multi-layered solution. So, uh, to sum up a little bit, uh, what is work-life balance? It is a key to mending the gender pay gap. It is one of the keys to mending the gender pay gap. And we have had some very interesting developments with regards to the gender pay gap recently, uh, where uh, we or I have been involved in developing a equal pay standard and international standards organization standard on equal pay, where we can drive a tool through organizations where we uh, not only promote equal pay, but we, we measure it and uh, we acknowledge that a, a, a system is, or an organization is uh, tackling it. Uh, there is the importance of quality of life and the acknowledgement that gender equality and work-life balance is not a zero-sum game. You, you do not take from men and give to women or, or give to women and take from men, we can both benefit from uh, policy initiatives. And we do. There is a necessity for the demographic sustainability, so it plays into not only demographic uh, sustainability, but economic growth. And this is our, our, our current problem and, and this will also and this is your problem as well how do we convince how do we convince organizations that in the short term this will cost this will cost money basically but the policies must be in place we discussed possible tax uh, initiatives the policies must be in place uh, to look past the short-term effect or the, the cost effect and look at the general long-term positive economic effects which we are striving for. So what do we need to do to drive these changes? It says uh, the conclusion is almost evident. We need to work on many fields 
simultaneously, but we must also, and I, uh, I would like to promote this, we must also uh, be critical, we must protest, because government doesn't always listen, government has a general idea about the need, but when we do protest, as women have done with regards to sexual harassment, with regards to the labor market, uh, government wakes up a little bit. So I think we should take, uh, um, take the grassroots uh, organizations and, and use them as a, as a tool to address this issue. Because in our experience, especially with gender equality plans, the initiative does not come from organizations. And even though we often speak of the importance of corporate social responsibility and so forth, um, for lack of a better description, and I don't mean to uh, uh, insult, but for, for lack of a be better uh, analysis, um, uh, the companies and organizations, they cannot be trusted. Uh, within a, a, a capitalist market economy, it's very easy for them to say, sorry, we can't be bothered. Even though the, the, the idea is there and the, and, the, and the understanding of corporate social responsibility, we cannot wait for corporations to take the initiative. The pressure must come from society and from the organizations that deal with the issues. So, uh, in relation to this, I would like to just uh, end on the note that uh, we must not be afraid of discussing these issues in terms of social engineering. And social engineering has a very negative connotation. It has a connotation with regards to like heavy uh, social market economies, socialism, communism, etc. But what are we doing? I mean, we, we need to change the systems. And we can change the systems as we have done with regards to parental leave in Iceland, with regards to care policies in Iceland. And you can call that social engineering if you, if you lack a better term. And uh, that is at least the uh, position of the Center for Gender Equality in Iceland. Thank you.